Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. This is probably going to be one of the reviews where we're like, hey, why didn't we do this eight or nine or ten years ago? Um, we're we're going to be talking about the book Lamb by Christopher Moore, which is probably one of the first books that we talked about, I think, as a, as a f- friends, as friends, before we even had the idea of doing a podcast. I didn't think about that, but you're you're probably right. So um, this one is going to serve, obviously, as a sentimental review for me and Rob, as Rob just mentioned. Um, it's also going to serve as a holiday review because we're coming up on one of those holidays that uh, I guess kind of features prominently in, in this book. Um, it's going to be a throwback episode. I mean, we have this fits so many. We can check so many boxes with this one. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it's just nice. Sometimes you got to treat yourself. And I think around the holidays, things have been like really tough and everything. Um, this is one of those books we know that we we're going to enjoy reading. So might as well just to give it, give, give ourselves a little, um, a little treat after all of the rigmarole of the year. But anyway, we could, we could ramble on about all like the, the, the good feels that this gave us. I'm going to give you an author bio for Christopher Moore really quick. And then Livius is going to tell you about this book in case for some reason you've never heard of like probably one of the most, you know, iconic books of, of what the, the two thousands out of our generation yeah, for sure. It always sounds important when you say yeah. that <laughs> of the generation, a generation defining tome. Uh, Christopher Moore is the author of 15 previous novels, Practical Demon Keeping, Coyote Blue, Blood Sucking Fiends, Island of the Sequin Love Nun, The Lust Lizard of Melancholy Cove, Lamb, Fluke, The Stupidest Angel, A Dirty Job, You Suck, Fool, Bite Me, Sacre Bleu, The Serpent of Venice, and Secondhand Souls. He lives in San Francisco. Um, and then obviously, like, there's been probably four or five books since Secondhand Souls that we have, um, I think we've reviewed all of. So this this bio is a little bit dated, and I want to point out for anybody who's listening who already is a Christopher Moore fan, but may not know. Um, in addition to, I think this is probably like the seventh or eighth book of his that we've done a review for on the podcast. Um, we actually got him on the podcast for an interview earlier this year, back in episode four hundred ninety five, which is definitely um, a bucket list thing for the podcast, but also I think both of us individually. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. It's um, it's one of the top moments um, in this podcast, at, at least for me, I'd say easily in the top five. Yep. All right. Here is the synopsis. Um, everyone knows about the Immaculate Conception and the Crucifixion, but what happened to Jesus between the manger and the Sermon on the Mount? In this hilarious and bold novel, the acclaimed Christopher Moore shares the greatest story never told, the life of Christ as seen by his boyhood pal Biff. Just what was Jesus doing during the many years that had gone unrecorded in the Bible? Biff was there at his side, and now after 2,000 years, he shares those good, bad, ugly, and miraculous times. Screamingly funny, audaciously fresh, Lamb rivals the best of Tom Robbins and Carl Hyacin and is sure to please this gifted writer's fans and win him legions more. I find legions an interesting um, term here because Mm -hmm. legion comes up in two different ways in this very book. Yeah, that is. I I wonder if that was tongue in cheek or just um, a a coincidence. Yeah, I'm guessing coincidence because that shit at the end is added by somebody at the at the publisher for sure. Yeah, like I don't know how how much he had, you know, input on the synopsis, but I don't think he was at home typing out, you know, rivals Tom Robbins. Yeah, that would be a little weird for the author to say that about themselves. Yes, for sure. Um, I'd like to point out, uh, before we dig into the story, there's a couple of things to point out, obviously. First of all, um, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with this book, uh, the synopsis basically plays it out. Uh, a lot of the book has to do with like the history of the life of Jesus Christ, who, like, you know, it's probably one of the most read stories ever if we're talking about the Bible. Um this just kind of fills in the blanks. So um, spoilers, probably not going to be something that we worry about too much because practically everybody knows at least the broad strokes of what happened to Jesus. Um, The other thing is, and I don't know if we're going to go into this or not, I did not grow up religious at all. So I don't have 
like a church kind of like reinforcement of like understanding what happened in the Bible. So this, this is kind of like a, a turnaround. Like Livius always likes to learn from like facts from fiction. And this is me learning fiction from fiction. Kind of. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess you jab. brought it up. I should. Yeah, I, I gotcha. Um, yeah. So this, uh, this, there, there might be some spoilers as Rob mentioned, you know, it's, it's, you know, ah, uh, people do you think have read the bible that's a lot of fucking words in the bible dude and i'm yeah. wondering how many people have read it i'm i i know it's the best-selling book of all time that's without a doubt how many words in the bible um <laughs> i really wonder how many people have read it um there are seven hundred and eighty-three thousand one hundred and thirty-seven words wow so if you take the general idea, I think our book that we published is about a hundred thousand words. Mm -hmm. And I think it's close to like 350 to 400 pages. Yeah. Ooh, times like over seven. Yeah. Mama. Yeah. So you're talking about a 1500 page book and, and, um, in, in really, my experience, and I guess I should qualify this next statement. Um, I have read some of the Bible, um, mostly when I was a small child, because I went to a Lutheran school through fourth grade. Um, my parents are lightly religious. Um, we were not regular churchgoers. Um, I am not religious at all in in my uh, in my adulthood, or you know, any time since you know, probably since I was ten, maybe. Um, it's not it's not written like this Christopher Moore book or like something you'd want to read. You know, it's it's like verses, if that's even the right way to say it. So it's not like it's a it like it's a fifteen hundred page beach read. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. So, um, but yeah. So there's that. There's my my background. I, I do know a little bit about religion. I uh, although I'm not religious, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated a little bit by religious storytelling and religious art. Um, so I, I have a I guess an appreciation or at least an interest, if not always an appreciation for these things. So yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this goes, but I, I will start by saying, I think, you know, everything you need to know about the new Testament after reading lamb. That's uh that's good to know. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I, I need is a strong word. I don't feel like I needed to know anything about it, but in the in the context of understanding what happens and why, I guess yes, I'll t I'll take that. <laughs> All right. So the book kicks off um, with a look at Jesus as a as a youngster, and, and maybe Rob, you can maybe frame this a little for me. But uh, he's uh, seven or eight, um, and we see him through the eyes of Biff, who comes across Jesus while Jesus is performing. Um, a little magic trick for his younger brother, and he is taking a lizard, and uh, the 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 the, uh, the brother's killing a lizard. And then Jesus is putting it in his mouth and bringing it out back alive, handing it back to his little brother, who is who then smashes it again, um, and, and and the cycle continues. And that's how we're first introduced to Jesus through the eyes of Biff, his best friend. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the other, so there's going to be, I'm going to frame the, the format of the book a little bit. So the absolute overwhelming majority of the book is going to be Biff telling us about his time with Jesus, basically. Um, I'm going to say Josh because that's how he's referred to in the book because the, he, like the name Joshua, uh, you know, is he, like he explains the whole Jesus thing, but like. The name Joshua is what's used, but he calls him Josh. So I'm just going to go with Josh. I feel like that's that's going to be the thing that makes the most sense in my head. Um, so the overwhelming majority of the time, we are getting basically as the title, the the extended, the, main, the full title says, the gospel according to Biff, Christ childhood's pal. Um, but sometimes we cut to the actual time when Biff is writing his gospel. Um, so I'll tell you about how that goes down a little bit. Cause that happens early in the book as well. Um, basically at some point in modern times, modern ish around the time this is written, um, an angel named Raziel, Raziel. 
Yeah, you're on your own on that one. Raziel? I'm going to say Raziel. Um, comes to Earth and raises Biff from the dead um, and basically sequesters him in a in a in like a motel room and gives him the order to write his gospel of um, his time with Jesus. Uh, and so, like I said, while the majority of the story is going to be told uh, in the time of Christ's life, um, it does cut to little inter- to interludes here and there of the quote present day where um, Biff is interacting with this uh, angel, Raziel, which I should point out is the angel who is the main, is the is the title character of the book, The Stupidest Angel, which is like absolutely one of my favorite books I've ever read. Yeah, and I think we, we might talk a little bit about that um, after we talk about Lamb, too. I think that there's some probably some good things to talk about there. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> In the gospel that shall forever be known as Biff, or maybe Levi, which is his actual name, but but everyone calls him Biff, um, we, we see, the, I'm, I'm going to jump out a little bit and then we can come back. So essentially, Moore's thought here was to cover not just the stuff we know, but all the stuff we don't know. And he explains really well in an author's note, there's not a lot known about uh, about Josh's childhood. Um, so if you read the Bible, there's a couple of mentions of his birth, and that's it. And we don't basically see him until he's in his 30s or maybe late 20s um, in the Bible. So this is to serve to fill in the time in between and what brought Josh slash Jesus, um, you know, to, to to be the person that, that we know from the Bible or movies or when you're forced to go to Sunday school or, or, or whatever the situation is. Uh, that being said, we go back to when they meet again. They're eight or nine years old, and we see um, some some time in their youth. Uh, and, and the book moves pretty quickly through age groups. And at some places, you read you know fifty pages, and, and you've moved six years or three years, you know, into the future. <clears throat> but we basically get a look at um, Biff, who's a little bit of a of a character, um, doesn't take things very seriously, and then Josh's uh, knowledge that he is the Messiah. And when I say knowledge, he, he has some doubts, but, but he has reason to believe that he might be the Messiah and how he's coming to terms with that. Right. And so, um, the book is broken up into, I think four parts. The first part really is, um, establishing them as friends in their childhood, um, showing who is important in their lives at the time, but also, Really, I think um, showing what the tone and the like day to day life of a Jew in a, in a Roman occupied city was like um, was kind of a big deal. Uh, not a fun, not a glamorous life if you uh, didn't you know kind of act the way the Romans wanted you to. Like there was lots of death, but then there was also like it demonstrated um, like the priestly side of things, um, the the church or, or whatever side of things where. Um, the Pharisees were pretty strict about the things you could and couldn't do. People were getting stoned to death all the time. And, and so he establishes well, um, the Roman rule part, the, um, the kind of absurdity of like the, the laws of the church at the time, but primarily the childhood of Josh and Biff and, and Maggie and like they're this kind of group of three friends who um really Josh is the the focus of the group. Biff's there because of Josh. Maggie's there because of Josh. Biff's got a big thing for Maggie. Josh is a thing for Maggie. Maggie's got a thing for Josh. Um but they're this like core group of friends who are uh, living in the time that they are, but also coming to terms with the fact that it's becoming more and more obvious that their friend actually is the son of God and like the Messiah who's going to bring the kingdom to their, you know, to their city or whatever. So um, uh, just imagine being a teenager in that time, in that place, knowing that um, your friend is the son of God and what a crazy thing that is, but then also like the hazards and the dangers that come with it. So I feel like he did a good balance of um, demonstrating the good parts of life, the bad parts of life, and like the strength of the friendship that came out of it. 
Absolutely. I want to clarify for um, anybody that Maggie is, um, I was going to say not a fictional character, but um, she, she is a character. So Biff, Biff was systematically <laughs> taken out of the Gospels. OK. And uh, like we mentioned before, for some reason, he's been brought back to write his account uh, of the Gospels. Um, Maggie refers to Mary Magdalene, who uh, does feature somewhat in the Gospels and has been a question. Um, there's been a big question mark around her for, I'm going to assume, hundreds of years. I don't know for a fact, but there's there's a lot um, uh, around her. And I, I don't know how much of it Rob is uh, is is knowledgeable um, about. But uh, again, maybe that's something we can touch on a little bit when maybe at the end comparing this to, you know, the 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 biblical story and the, the potential reality around it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think Rob did a really good job of summing up um, the, the first part. Um, the, the next kind of bigger plot point that, that carries us into the story are, you know, what are referred to by people as the missing years um, when Josh and Biff um, go off on a journey, and that journey is to find the three wise men um, who who appeared, who followed the star to Jesus' birth and brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Um, so, so they have to leave their home to to do so. And through the course of the book, and, and we can touch on you know little parts here and there, but essentially that journey is you know they they go to see each one and spend a, a very good deal of time um, with each one of them. Right. So the departure from, um, where do they live? I can't remember the name of the town they live in. Oh God. I don't uh, know. Anyway, the, their departure from home, um, is, is timed just before, uh, Maggie's wedding. Cause they both kind of love her and they can't bear to see her like marry some douchebag that who she got like betrothed to or whatever. And so, um, but they have to go to, um, they, yeah, they basically go out in search of, of the three wise men, like Livia said, and to do that, they head out toward a town called Antioch. And then they start like basically following, um, at the time they leave, what are they? 17, I think something like that. I believe they were younger than that. I think they were like 14. Okay. Either way, like the lead. Can I, can I interject for a moment Yeah, this with a, with a local, a local joke, you know, what we call North of Antioch. Wisconsin. <laughs> so they go north into Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but like, I guess I, the point I was making with their age is that um, all he knows about the wise men was that they showed up at his birth. So the last time anybody knew anything about them was when he was born. So he's like, they're, they're following like a 15 year old cold lead basically now. Um, and so they, they go out in search of, uh, uh, you know, the, the wise men and they, you know, they've never really like traveled outside of town and they're teenagers. So I have to imagine that like, that's a treacherous, uh, task, like undertaking to just kind of go off on your own, but they do. And, um, you know, they actually find some luck, I think plot wise, you know, it's, it's more of like, we're going to stick to the points of like, just getting it along to like where the story needs to be. So we don't like spend a lot of time on their journey to find the first, Wise men, we get there pretty quickly. That first wise man is Balthazar. Um, he is uh, <clears throat> considerably older than we expect people to live. Uh, I believe it's 260 years old by the time we actually find that out. Um, but that's really where where the shaping of of this this middle part of the book, you know, starts to 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 take place. Um, he he teaches them Zen Buddhism, Confucianism. Taoism, and essentially is trying to impart. How do I say this? He's doing his part to teach Josh what he thinks he needs to know to be the Messiah. Um, that being said, it's really where more kind of looked at at other similar, um, you know, mostly Eastern, I guess, all Eastern um, traditions and, and religions. Um, and, and where the crossover is with the teachings of Jesus that we have today. Um, but uh, obviously done in a, in a far more entertaining way than, you know, than, than it likely would have been in reality, I guess I'll say. So 
following this story, uh, there's the there's the Joshua side of it, which is very studious, very focused on learning how to basically be a messiah. But you know, it boils down to like understanding life and and the meaning of things and and all of that. And Josh is along for the ride, and so he has to kind of like cooperate. But it's not always um, like parallel. So while Josh is off learning, you know, all of these more philosophical things, uh, Biff's, Biff's time is spent with, uh, this kind of list of concubines learning different things about how to like alchemy and, and make like explosives and weapons and poison and stuff. So while, while Josh is becoming, (laughs) becoming more and more Messiah, like Biff is basically becoming uh, like the perfect bodyguard almost in a way. Uh, but he's also, you know, the super horny dude that's trying to hook up with all the concubines. So that's happening as well. For sure. And there you uh, you brought up a, a really good point about their relationship is that um, we're seeing the story through Biff's eyes. But Biff is um, Josh's biggest um, supporter throughout. Their friendship is really what features most um, prominently through through the course of this book. And, and you know, I, for me. Uh, it's most endearing quality is uh, is their friendship. Um, but yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, as they go through all three of these, he continues to, to become more and more knowledgeable in the ways that will obviously serve the story best <laughs> later in the book. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and the relationship is, is interesting because I, I feel like Biff loves Josh more than Josh loves Biff because Josh loves everyone. Right. So in his role right. of, of, you know, future Messiah, um, he really uh, imparts to, to everybody that's important to be accepting of everybody, which really, quite honestly, makes it really funny when he gets into those situations where he's like, nope, we're out of here. Like, you know, he's like all open arms. And he's like, no, no, we're going to we're going to forego this particular situation. Um, but yeah. So, um, you know, not to go into too much detail of what. uh what uh you know their their time with Balthazar is that's something that you the reader should discover himself know that that time comes to a close um over a a, a pretty you know uh, over uh, with with a with its own pretty big climax and they move on to go see the second of the wise men who is Gaspar um Gaspar and Rob did a great job with the notes by the way um, Gaspar, uh, why, you know, is responsible for teaching him Kung Fu and Jiu Jitsu, um, which, uh, you know, more self-defense, uh, in fighting styles, but also, um, you know, the, the kind of meditative aspect that goes along with that. Yes. I, and, and I'm going to point out, um, at, throughout the book as, um, as he's learning from Baltazar and Gaspar and everybody, um, it, it's cool to see how Christopher Moore will tie the lesson of something that Josh learned to something that later like surfaced in the Bible. So he really did a good job of weaving this kind of uh, disparate philosophical uh, learning into what would create a person like Jesus and like the outcome of that. Like, how did these individual things? build a person who became Jesus Christ basically. So um I, I think he did a good job of showing that throughout. Um the Gaspar part, yeah, was really a lot of um the more monkish kind of like um mind over matter, um controlling your body, um overcoming um like discomfort and stuff, like the the monks have learned how to like sit in the cold and and basically meditate to the point where they, their bodies radiate heat so that they're not like affected by the cold. So a lot of his learning in this is, is, is focused on like the more mind over matter stuff, but also like uh, I I like the way that jujitsu is introduced as like a form of Kung Fu that was made specifically for him because he wouldn't use a weapon while he was learning how to fight and so he, they created a an entirely um not even defensive but like a deflective form of of martial art for him 
Um, and actually, just just a correction: if anybody's like screaming at their their car radio right now or whatever, it's it's judo. Oh, judo. Yeah. Yeah. J-E-W. You know what? Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. It's judo. I, well, judo. So yeah, the way of the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and as a note of explanation, I probably know about as much about martial arts as I do about religion. So. Uh, my apologies to all the judo and jujitsu people out there who are like Rob's a fucking idiot. Um, I am about that for sure. <laughs> and then we move on to the the third and final of the wise men. Here's my my turn to to butcher a name Mel- Melchior. I go with Melchior. Yeah. And uh, again, there he learns about Hinduism and the divine spark. Um, so as Rob said, there's a really good job done of weaving um, the different aspects of these things into what is um, uh, taught as modern Christianity and what, what uh, you know, Christ's uh, teachings were. Um, so, yeah, through the middle part of the book, it, it kind of follows the same pattern. They go there, they learn some stuff, something happens, they, they move on, et cetera, et cetera, until we get uh, through uh, the Melchior. And after that, they're, uh, they're, they're back to uh, they're back home. And that's really where the Gospels, uh, the, where the correlation to the Gospels picks up and, and the story becomes much more familiar for, for anybody who's somewhat familiar with the Gospels. Yeah. And I don't know how much we want to go into, like, all, obviously we'll talk a little bit about it, but um, I don't want to, I'll probably do some more egregious, like, misrepresentation of things that are, are obvious to other people, uh, much like my judo uh, gaff, But, um I think the themes of Joshua getting back home are that it's become much more dangerous to go against the, the traditional like um, practices or beliefs of the church as it is. Uh, and so um, when they get back to town, Josh is ready to start, you know, seriously preaching and building up a following. Um, but um, John the Baptist, his cousin has already, been preaching about the coming of you know the savior and all this stuff and so he's already drawing some un unhealthy attention to the idea that um the savior or the messiah is coming um and so they come back ready to save everyone but it might be them that need saving kind of in the beginning because the church and the romans uh, are only going to let it go so far before they step in Yeah, and and I I do think we should probably go back and talk about you know some things because I feel like we laid this out like it's a real serious book and and although I, and I will say that of all the more books I read I feel like this one has some parts that are that are significantly serious that isn't something I really remember from any of other Moore's books like they usually stay pretty tongue in cheek but there's some pretty dark um, dark parts of this book and and you know our protagonist Biff goes through some pretty dark stuff. But but yeah, that's um, that's it. He picks up the disciples and then uh, everybody at this point probably should know um, how this whole thing comes to a conclusion. So I don't know that we need to go much farther as far as story goes. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, but yeah, I, I want to say that um, in, in finishing the book and reflecting on it, having read, I think I've read every book. I, I've read every book of Moore's. Um, on the tone or, or the 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 level of humor in this one versus other ones because you just brought it up kind of um i feel like there is a constant presence of humor um but it's not as overt um it's not as silly like you know when you have like people t- transforming into squirrels and, and and a serious amount of sex and stuff like that it takes away some of the seriousness of the book this I think takes a more like sober approach to telling the story, but still interweaving just a ton of hilarious stuff. So um, it's still a very funny, amusing, entertaining book, and I think that's a big strength of it is that it's it's got the classic more humor, but it's just um, maybe it's more somber topic. Maybe it's just the way he wrote it was more reverent, but there's something that's more that's different about this one. Yeah, I, I think the characters, um, 
uh, Moore's whole body of characters are probably well represented, but this one, oddly enough, minus miracles, um, yeah, removes that kind of uh, goofy at times supernatural element that we expect from him, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but then, like I said, there are times in this book, like, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. They are, um, oh God, right after they go out on their journey, um, they they go to whatever town it is where they're doing their annual sacrifice. And there's probably like a solid two pages where Biff is losing his mind over it. And, and there probably isn't a humorous line in those two pages. It's very, very dark, um, you know, and, and treated likely like, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's when they go, it's the first city they stop at where they wind up um, saving the children from getting their fingers cut off. Oh, that like was the first. No, this is the Melchior part. That was toward the. Oh, that's the end. no, no. You're right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. It was in Calcutta. It was prior to that, it's when the when the lambs are being. Yeah. Well, yes. When well, no. The yeah, yes. So that was in Calcutta, where the lambs are being sacrificed. I think it's right. Before oh they, yeah. They, um, right when they start out on their. Oh, journey. when they like, they there's... they went to Jerusalem for um. Yep. Yeah, one of the holidays, and they had to have the lambs. Yeah, slaughtered. Yes. Yeah, you're right. That was yeah. tough. Yeah, I mean, and there's uh, there's a part where where um, <clears throat> Biff is basically asked to leave. And there's some pretty there's some pretty hard stuff in there about friendship and loss and and you know doing what you know is the right thing and you know and like I said, that, those parts for me were were more serious from a character standpoint than I, I think anything else I've read from him. I'll agree. Uh, I I'm gonna hundred percent agree with that point. I'm going to bring up uh, something that you, you just made me think of, though, with Biff having to leave somewhere. Um, did you notice the Fight Club reference? Uh, oh, I, I, <laughs> no. I, I, I feel like, me, no, I don't think I did. The moment I say it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. But um, So I had to look up the dates of when both of those came out just to make sure that it would, like, one preceded the other. But um, when they get to the temple to... to um, Gaspar's temple. Oh, when there's yes, they have to wait outside three days, yeah. um, and it's to weed out the insincere. Basically, is what they say. But like, basically, this person through a slot in the door keeps insulting them and telling them like negative things about themselves and telling them to go away. And they have to stay for three days to be let in, but they don't know that. And so it's absolutely um, the Fight Club scene where, like, at the Paper Street Soap Company place, like they keep telling you know they do the same thing. So. Um, I was like, is this, did this inspire Fight Club or did Fight Club inspire yeah. this? I was too stuck on it being a Wizard of Oz um, reference, I think, in my head to, to, to see past it to Fight Club. You've <laughs> Wizard, seen the Wizard wait, of Oz, yes. Yeah, but I'm not getting the connection. Oh, when, when, they, when, they, get to, um, when they get to Emerald City, the, oh, basically yeah, the same thing yeah. happens. The guy keeps just yelling at oh, them to go away and right. their appearance and yeah and telling them to leave and they you know they don't have to wait for three days but yeah you're absolutely right that's probably a little closer to fight club than it is to to the wizard of oz well now i'm wondering which which way that more would have gone hmm so off off topic i don't know what copy you have i believe in the afterward he actually talks about the wizard of oz yeah so maybe it's maybe it's you yeah oh well i it's still a fight club analog Oh yeah, no, for sure, absolutely, and and like I said, probably more so because they're kept outside for far longer than Dorothy and crew spend outside the um, um, Emerald City. Um, I we we should touch on the today stuff, and as Rob said, I, I it probably makes up five percent of the book, maybe eight percent of the book. Um, but even that, uh, just being locked in a hotel room with an angel, um, provides for uh, you know a, a little bit of a little bit more insight, I think, into Biff's character. But also, um, you know, kind of a, a, a cool look at, at two people who are not familiar with, you know, I'll roughly say the year 2000, right? And and and, and how they can interpret uh, that. Uh, Biff was granted the gift of tongues, so he speaks English and Raziel does not. Um, but from a story standpoint, I'm not going to say nothing important happens in, in the today um, but but I will say that uh, it, it's equally as entertaining, although it's a much smaller part. The today stuff to me was just as much fun as the the two thousand year ago story. Yeah, um, and it sets up a great um, 
so uh well we don't have to care about spoilers so um in the in the way back time the in that biff's gospel is covering um it doesn't end well obviously for anybody really in the story except for like you know christ died for your sins so apparently that's a good thing um so thumbs up for that uh but you know everybody is pretty miserable it doesn't work out well for biff obviously he dies um so the 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 current day time is really kind of a a a way to give him more of a a happy ending to his story because his story in the olden days ends with the person who he dedicated his entire life to protecting and supporting uh being murdered <laughs> so the present day time really gives him an opportunity to have a a, a happier ending and likely one of my favorite endings of a uh, of a book ever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything else you want to touch on? Um, I don't know. Like uh, we, when we were talking about, so I think this kind of comes up, and it actually even came up in in our conversation with more. Um, I think every time we have a more book, this book comes up, and it wasn't his first book, but. Um, it's kind of the high watermark for a lot of people as far as his writing goes. And so when I went into reading this, I was, I was keeping that in mind. Like I didn't want to accidentally bias myself toward the book just because everybody says, Oh, this is his, his, you know, big thing. Um, but I think it, it might be his big thing. (laughs) I might have to just say that's his big thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it came up during the interview, and I, I think we mentioned it last week, right? The, uh, oh, I really like this book, but not as much as I like Lamb. And and look, to be fair, I, I think I think there's something to that. I've enjoyed nearly every Christopher Moore book. I've also read all of them, with one exception. I got about halfway in a fluke and just couldn't do it. I just didn't like that one. Other than that, I would love everything he does, but Lamb will remain. I possibly will remain. I guess we'll see what's, what's uh, coming up next from him. Lamb is goddamn brilliant. It's brilliant because uh, and the thing he's done most recently, right? Shakespeare for squirrels. He's taken a story we've known and kind of in, injected his own his own humor into it and his own look at it. Um, I also feel like when this came out, this might have been a fairly brave book to put out. And, and he mentions it a little bit in the afterward about you know that this is probably going to offend some people. I, I really don't see anything offensive about this book. Um, but I, I would imagine, like I said, at the time it came out, he probably faced some backlash for this, too. And and maybe taking that risk is what winds up making it one of his greatest books. Yeah, I, I was going to make it. I was actually going toward that point uh, next, which was going to be um, there could have been a stakes issue with why this book was written, the quality and maybe thoughtfulness that it was, um, because I have to imagine when you choose to write. Uh, a story about Jesus's life, you, you're going to worry that more people are going to be, um, have be invested in what that story sounds like. Um, but so I have the book, so I have the original, this is not a flex. This is just in my collection. I have the original hardcover first edition, but then I also have, um, the, the special edition that came out later. That's like a Bible. Like it's got the leather cover and the, gold mm-hmm. embossed like edges and stuff and that's got a, an additional author's note that came out like six years later and it talks about part of it talks about the response that he got and the overall idea was that you know people got it like they understood what he was going for and it was actually even taught in like seminaries and and some like um church classes and stuff like that so um he was really worried that the reception would be like a misunderstanding of his um, his intent, but it seems like actually for the majority people got it, did the, got the, got it the way he meant it. Which I'm really happy to hear it. And the other thing I think it's important too, is that he really tried to drive home. He stayed very true to, to the, to the, the teachings of the church around the Bible. So although you know, there's there's some sex humor that I guess super religious people could be uh, offended by um, or mischaracterizations of things. He, he hit all the big points. 
Um, he did not make Josh slash Jesus Christ into um, anything but what people who follow his teachings believe him to be. Like he's gentle and he's kind and he has a message and he's accepting and loving. Um, you know, this could have gone a whole different way too, right? He could have made Jesus into the into Biff, which probably would not have gone over. Right, really that well, would have been right? like, like, yeah, yeah, like a dumb guy who kind of just stumbles, luckily stumbles into, uh, you know, the 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 miracles that are performed or, or whatever. So I, I think he handled it with with great care, and, and you know, so it still remains one of my all time favorite books after after this reread as well. Yeah, and I think an important thing is that at least to, to my knowledge, kind of like you said about the character, he didn't do anything to disrupt A, the history as it's known, or B, the intent of the Bible as far as he could get. So like he he did, a, like like you were saying, he was really careful to like leave everything. It was like he was visiting the rainforest and it's like you take only photos and you leave only footprints. Like he did that kind of thing to this particular story and I think that probably bought... Um, a lot of goodwill. Well, I'm pondering over that uh, that 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 piece of brilliance you just spat out there. I, I don't believe I heard <laughs> that before. You haven't heard that? Oh, that's like a common like when you're going to like a place that is endangered, whatever. That's oh. the anyway. I, yeah, I definitely usually, did not come up with when that. I'm, yeah, when I'm going to places, I'm the most likely one to be endangered. So I guess I don't I don't get told that kind of stuff a lot. <laughs> Like take only Livius's wallet and leave only bruises. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I, I mean, I guess we can go to wrap ups, and then there's something else I want to talk about a, a little bit, and I guess we'll see if there's any interest in in further discussion on that. I am going to take the liberty of going first on this one. Cool. I want to start by saying this is one of my all time favorite books. I think that the story is hugely entertaining. Um, it is a, a, a tongue in cheek look at. Ooh, I, probably the best known story of, of all time. I don't don't think I'm going out on a limb and saying that. Um, it's done in a way that's lighthearted, as I mentioned. I find it hard to see that the average uh, the average Christian would be would be offended by it, and and I think that some um, might even appreciate it. Sometimes taking a little bit of levity with with the stuff that you take really serious can can probably be um, a good thing. It is probably the funniest Christopher Moore book in my opinion. Um, and I also think it's his best characters that, that he's done because this bond between Maggie, Josh and, and Biff is amazing. And I will tell you, although it did not happen on this reading, I vividly remember crying at the end of this book the first time I read it, which is something that's happened. I don't know, a handful of times in my now nearly 50 years. So, uh, I know everybody's expecting this might be my first 10. It's not going to be. And here's why. Um, it's an issue I had with the book on its first reading. And it's the same issue that remains on my second reading. Um, and I dinged it a little bit for pace. I did think that the 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 act two, the middle, the middle of the book was probably a little, little longer winded than it needed to be. And I think it for me, it took me out of it um, a little bit uh, on this second um, reading as well. So I did give it a seven for pace, gave it a 10 for everything else. Um, that's going to bring my final score to 9.63, um, which is also I'm, I'm fairly certain my highest score I've given to any book since we uh, since we started this new system. Well, I just went straight 10. So I'm going to start off by saying that um, I've only read this book once before and it was probably, I, I would imagine it's probably close to when it came out um, since we started the podcast in 2000. Eh, I don't know. It was probably mid two thousands that I read the book. Um, and I remember really enjoying it. And oddly, the thing that I thought at the time was that the ending was very abrupt um, and, and a little bit, it was probably like the least, um, like congruous with the rest of the story, I would say. Um, so I was definitely paying attention to the ending this time around to see how it clicked in my mind. And I think that um, it was way better for me this time. So uh, a book that I had already thought very highly of got a little bit better for me um, from first reading to second reading. And, and you know, we've, we've spent praise all over this book. Um, you know what we loved about it. I think that as far as 
um, like the different metrics that we typically judge a book by um, more was just way more careful or thoughtful uh, with this book than, than his other offerings, all of which are great. Um, so raving about this book should do nothing to take away from any of his other books. Um, that being said, uh, I think that the idea to tell this story, it's a, it's crazy. No one ever, to my knowledge, thought to do it before. Uh, B, um, was just a cool idea. And, and I think that Livius hit on something when we were talking earlier. Um, a lot of his stuff that, that takes place within historical things is an adaptation or an interpretation of something that happened. Whereas this is original stuff that fills in an empty space. And maybe that's something that makes it stand out because it's not a retelling of Hamlet or the serpent of Venice or whatever other Shakespeare stuff that, you know, he's, he's writing about. It is taking an existing character and doing something different and new with them. So that might add something to the, the feeling of originality or, or whatever. All that being said, this book is more, uh, performing at, the top of his ability and all of the things that people like Christopher Moore for. So if you've read anything of his before and enjoyed it, this is definitely going to be something that you uh, strongly appreciate. Uh, I'm not going to call out individual things. The whole book was just done. It's, it's as close to a perfect book as you could ask for, um, especially with such interesting or controversial uh, subject matter. So like I said before, I gave it a 10. And so me and Livius average out to nine, 0.8125, Point eight one two five, uh, which is absolutely the biggest score we've given to uh, a book in this new rating system this year. Yeah, I, 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 what I say is I feel bad for all the other books we've read because I knew we were going to come into this higher than anything because it's it's collectively one of our favorite books. I mean, we could throw with raw shark texts would probably do equally as well if we were to rate it under under the new system. Um, for anybody who's newer to the podcast, we just used to use a plain five star system. So really, we had the perfect book like 12 times a year or something, right? Like where we just give us the five yeah. stars. And yeah. now with the system, it's it's, you know, I, I was gonna say nearly impossible, but Rob just did it. It's it's really fucking difficult to get to a 10. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I do want to mention if you do want something a little lighter, I know we're super close to Christmas. Maybe you don't want to spend, you know, eight hours reading a book or whatever. Um, Rob mentioned the stupidest angel, which is absolutely a Christmas tale. Um, it, uh, it does feature Raziel, the angel from lamb, the gospel, according to Biff Christ childhood pal. Um, but it really is the third book in the, uh, pine cove series. So you will meet some other characters that you would probably, There would probably be some benefit to having read those before, but I don't think you need to do it. And when I said it's his funniest book, I don't know, Stupidest Angels, at least a tie, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm on the on the Wikipedia now of all the more books. Um, And yeah, well, and that's I had to like that. I probably got the most like fanboyish when we were talking to more uh, about the Stupidest Angel because he pulls off just like this like unseen awesome thing, like almost probably 80% Mm -hmm. into the book. And it just, it just blew me away so much that I was like, I can't believe this guy did this. Um, uh, so yeah, I would say funniest for sure. Um, yeah, definitely stupidest angel. It is absolutely a, a Christmas story for sure. And just weird and hilarious and, um, well, there's a lot less Jesus in there, but the, the angel Raziel definitely makes it a, a hilarious tale. I, think I thought I was thinking about it and it's, it's, I mean, I'm glad he made the choice, but knowing how much he likes to do little crossovers and stuff, I, I'm just a little surprised when I reflected back on the fact that we've never seen Biff in any of these other, any of these other books. Yeah. That did occur to me that, um, that, he he would definitely have the the capacity to cross over so uh maybe he just didn't find the right um like slot to slot him into so yeah yeah at least in a way i'm kind of happy yeah leave biff an icon because to me biff will always be the most iconic character and again i say always based on his current body of work who knows what what's coming forth 
Yeah. Hey, so now that we've had all the fun stuff, I said earlier we might talk a little bit about Mary Magdalene. So I don't know if you know this because I know that you um, uh, not only are not religious, but I, I think kind of shy away from from you know religious stuff and like following any of it. There has been yeah. for for millennia probably, and and I guess anybody could look this up if they want to. But there is a belief that um, that uh, Josh and I guess I guess I'll go back to calling him Jesus for 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 this portion of the conversation. And Mary Magdalene actually had a child, and that that bloodline still exists to this day. Oh, I, I watched the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> okay, all right. I didn't know. I, I guess I didn't know. I mean, I, I I knew it from there. I knew it before there. But yeah, the the Merovingian bloodline, I I think is why I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But yeah, that was one of the things when I said that, you know, she, she is a minor character in the Bible, um, but there's been a lot of speculation around her for, you know, however long it's been since uh, since the big four published the Bible or whatever. <laughs> that, yeah, I, I and jokingly, I said I've seen the Da Vinci Code, but that's literally the only um, frame of reference I have for anything in that storyline. But um, then then you're falling into like, uh, like religious conspiracy theories and and secret societies and stuff like that, right? And like Tom Hanks. Um, I mean, yeah. So you know, it, it depends on, on what you believe. Yes, I, I I I genuinely believe that in reality there has been a group of people who have been kind of guarding that bloodline for you know two thousand years. Um, I don't know about all the other stuff from from the Da Vinci Code. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting look. I feel like, did we talk about this before about the last supper painting? I feel like we talked about this on the podcast. Um, Um, why don't you go over it? Yeah. So, um, in, in my, in my childhood home, um, there was actually a painting of the last supper that hung in the living room. It was in the living room. And even as a little kid, I always thought that it was a little odd um, that that the one disciple sitting, I believe, directly to the left of Christ in that looked really feminine um, in comparison with all uh, the other disciples. Yeah. And then that's something that wound up coming up in the Da Vinci Code, that that was, uh, that was actually supposed to be Mary Magdalene and that it was left a little androgynous, but that Da Vinci wanted to represent um, her in the picture, but couldn't you know do so without being stoned to death or whatever happens to you if you do that. So... Yeah, so that's one of those kind of interesting. And this is when I say that I find sometimes find religion really interesting. Like that kind of shit's fascinating. So to to me anyway. It, yeah, it wouldn't be well. It's funny that like so like all of the ho- I, the thing that um, it's all predicated on is that um, like there are secrets about those types of things that are like um big enough that you have to like that would to die over which um i don't know that's where i I, that's where i struggle with it a bit um i will say in regards to that same uh piece of art the comedian john mulaney has this great bit where he's talking to his jewish wife and they're talking about doing um funny like uh staging photos of their dog in different like historical ways and they thought they could do um, the last supper with like all like a bunch of different dogs being all the, is it apostles? I think it's apostles. Right. Um, and his wife says, Oh yeah. And then, you know, our dog would be where Jesus would be in front of the Turkey. And then it turns out she thought there was a Thanksgiving Turkey in the photo and it's really funny. Um, so yeah, good, good John Blaney bit about that. And I guess I forgot this, but I do want to say, cause when you said it is apostle, right. The interesting thing is that he goes in to explain the difference between disciple and apostle in this, which I, I'm sure I knew, whatever, 15 years ago or whenever I first read this, but it was something I had forgotten and, and was uh, re-educated on um, through this rereading of Lamb. What was that distinction? Because I remember it being said, but I don't remember what the actual distinction was. So the disciples are when they're just kind of following him and and learning his teachings. Uh, Apostles are the ones that then go out and teach. So it's almost like a Mm -hmm. promotion. Like disciples are just followers, but apostles take your word to to the streets, so to speak. Like you become street team. So in the multi-level marketing, um, 
Jesus is at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> the apostles are the next level. And then the disciples are the ones that the, the apostles start to like accumulate. Yeah, essentially, right. yes. Although I don't know that anybody after those original 12 are referred to as disciples. But yeah, that's that's essentially how that works. There we go. I just made the church a multi-level yeah. marketing scheme. So there you go. Um, I, I think in some ways, you know, there's uh, there's something to be said for that. It is uh, it is for sure. There's a business aspect to it. And that's uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so um. Yeah. So, uh, I want to do, all right. So since Livius did a Christopher Moore related plug to, if you want to read, um, a a holiday themed Christopher Moore book, I want to throw in a holiday book. We haven't talked about in a long time, but I remember liking a bunch. Um, and it's a really short read. I think it's maybe 150 pages if that. Um, and it's by an author who I think if you like Christopher Moore, you'd probably enjoy these these books too, even though they kind of go in a different direction. And that would be I Saw Zombies Eating Santa Claus by S.G. Brown. Yeah, S.G. Brown, um, always a favorite uh, around these parts. I don't know that you can recommend that one without breathers, though. Like, I feel like that one's a little more dependent on on the source material. Yeah, right? I, I no? see. Yeah, because Breathers, it's got the character from Breathers is like the main guy yes. in this. Um, mm-hmm. I will say that I never read Breathers and I did read this and I enjoyed it. Oh, my God. You never so, read Breathers? Never read Breathers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I was not aware of that. I was like, I was like, hey, he's making this recommendation, which I, I love that book. But like, <laughs> You're like, I'm whoa, like, pump yeah. the brakes, Rob. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a little weird. That, but yeah, I guess. And, and, and there it goes. That's a testament to the fact that you don't you didn't have to read it because we always say like, oh, I wonder if this would have been different had I have read, you know, something yeah. else whenever we fall into one of those situations. So, well, I would say uh, read breathers if you have the time. But if you just want a quick fun Christmas read that has to do with zombies, you can just take that on its own. Yeah. SG Brown. And then after that, just read everything else. SG Brown's written too. Yeah. Even. Yeah. All, yeah. All of it. In keeping with the uh, holiday theme that we've presented so well, I think here, Rob, congratulations. Nice job. It won't be our next episode technically, but our holiday special, our, our, our booked holiday office party will be happening uh, this coming Sunday. Um, We are going to change things up a little bit this time. It is going to be on YouTube Live and not on Facebook, uh, but links will be available on Facebook, I'm sure, um, you know, as soon as we we go live on YouTube. Yeah, this is a tradition that goes back uh, how many years? Not the whole nine so far, Um, but I want to say that at least six or seven. I would say, yeah, six or seven is probably a safe bet. Yeah, and it started out with um, friend of the podcast Amanda Gowan, um, sleepy Gowan, who just overslept a couple of times and couldn't make it, and so um, eventually Misty started joining us for for the Christmas episodes. There, I know Livius's favorite is the Halloween episodes, and I would say probably I agree. But this is absolutely uh, one of the things I look forward to every year is 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 the. Christmas episode. We have our homework. We're working on it. We're going to have things to discuss. They're not Clive Barker things, so maybe we'll wrap up the discussions a little faster than we did with our Halloween episode, but Mm -hmm. always looking forward to uh, our Christmas stuff. Yeah, I'm going to say it just in case anybody wants to to play along. Um, We are going to be talking about the movies Gremlins and Scrooged. So uh, if you've got... uh, hour and a half or so to kill between now and then pick one of those movies and join us for a, uh, uh I I'm hoping a fun filled discussion about uh, those two movies along with other holiday type stuff we'll be doing. Um, and again, that'll be on YouTube this coming Sunday, the, what is that? The 20th, the 20th. Um, and yep. I believe at, I don't know, I don't even know if we have a time yet, but anyway, follow us on Facebook, um, for, for more info on that. Yeah, I believe we settled on 8 p.m. That's kind of our standard. So um, uh, it, I'm going to say definitively it's Sunday at 8 p.m. And then if that's not the case, we'll bully people into making that true. Uh, but that's not the next thing you're going to listen to from us. Uh, we do have a interview that we're going to be recording uh, in the next couple of days uh, with Les Edgerton. We, we just did a review of his book, Hard Times, and he is going to join us again. 
Um, we did an interview with him, I want to say almost two years ago when we did his memoir, Adrenaline Junkie. Um, and he's just always such a fun person to talk to. So looking forward to chatting with him about how the hell you write about such horrible depression era Texas stuff. <laughs> While we're on uh, telling you about all the things that are coming up, our final episode of the year will follow um, our Christmas special, and that will be a review of what I understand is the Goodreads pick of the year for books. So uh, we are going to challenge that and see if that is the best book that we've read that came out in 2020. That book will be The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. A, uh, it's the number one bestseller in time travel fiction right now, and uh, we're going to cover it here uh, basically like two weeks from now. If anybody will remember, we did a similar thing at the end of 2019 where we read Trust Exercise by Susan Joy, and uh, neither of us cared for it, really. So um, we'll see if uh, these kind of last ditch, let, let's read the most popular book of the year thing is is any better this time around because it was very disappointing last time. Can I tell you, I'm on the Amazon page for that book, and it is frequently bought together with Anxious People by Frederick Bachman and The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which sounds vaguely familiar, too. <laughs> um, I'm calling bullshit on there's a bunch of people that buy three books together for a total of 51 bucks from Amazon. Yeah, that's that's a little suspect. Is it ebooks, print books? It doesn't say. It yeah. just says frequently bought together. So, well, the price it gives me is for the for the hardcover as hmm. well. At least one. This one's a hardcover. I'm assuming. Yeah. No, they're all hardcovers. Did I already so, tell uh, the thing about buying anxious people in the bookstore? Did I ever? Did I already tell that story? You did not tell uh, the story the on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have this thing about I want to have a physical copy of every book that we review. Um, and so when we get digital arcs and stuff like that, I actually go to the store and I buy it at the store like, uh, any normal person would. And, um, so I went to Barnes and Noble, got a, pick, a copy of anxious people. And actually they had a stack of signed ones. So I just grabbed one of those. It was like a book plate edition kind of thing. And, um, for anybody who listened to that, uh, or I guess who didn't listen to that, I didn't really like the book nearly as much as Livius did. Livius gave it, gave it a pretty good rating, and I, I, I was a couple of full points below him in my rating. So I was picking it up more for the posterity of having it in the collection than because I was like, man, I gotta have it. I gotta represent this on my shelf. And so I, I wasn't super positive going in and buying that thing. And I'm in line, and the woman who's ringing me up, she she looks at the cover and she says, "Oh." I just heard the most wonderful review about this book. And I was like, oh, really? That's great. And that's all I said, because I didn't want to step on someone's good time or, you know, ruin like an experience because, hey, she's probably going to love that book. I'm the one that was was just fussy about it. But um, that was my that was funny that that was like the first time someone's been like, oh, I just heard a wonderful review about this. And it's the one I didn't like. Sir, that book is the number one bestseller in friendship fiction right now on Amazon. That's because I'm still working on my friendship fiction book. Dude, these categories are getting fucking narrower and narrower. <laughs> friendship <laughs> fiction is a category. This is the number one book. Ours, yeah, ours is the number one an anthology in um, anthologies published by a podcast, I'm assuming. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to suggest that that be a category, but it has to be a little more specific than that because fucking Night Vale is probably still well ahead of us. I'm Damn just guessing. They probably sold just a few guessing. more copies than us, I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, but listen, you can still buy a copy of the book anthology if you're looking for a last-minute Christmas gift for somebody um, yeah. on uh, yeah at that same place at, at Amazon. I don't know if you'll get it by Christmas. Uh, available ship in one to two days. Arrives before Christmas, go. and you can get... You can get that fine book for only fifteen ninety five. It's probably been like three years since we promoted this book, <laughs> but there you go. Pick up your copy for only sixteen bucks, or read free with Kindle Unlimited. There you go. Yeah, that's a bargain. Or I'm sure if you just bother us enough, we'll send you like a ebook file and an email or something like that. That is also a possibility. Or if you don't want to do that, it's only three dollars. Three dollars for the Kindle version, and the Kindle yeah. version has lots of extra stuff in it. Oh, that's true. 
Yeah, see, the things we forget when we don't talk about something for years. At any rate, thank you very much for listening. If you are one of our new subscribers on YouTube, thanks. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, If you're not, if you're listening on YouTube and you're not a subscriber, um, there are other ways you can listen. But if you're here, go ahead and subscribe and hit the like button. That would be wonderful if you could do that. And do the same thing in whatever podcast app you're listening to. Um, We'll be back in just a few short days with our uh, holiday special. Um, Until then, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.